Okay. Today we're going to be spending our hours on entomology, which is the study of insects. And if there's one common denominator for something that every master gardener needs to know something about, it's insects. I, I will say that if, if you've got plants and they don't have insects, then your plants are not part of the ecosystem. So, uh, if, if, you're, if you're actually growing in concert with nature, you're going to be dealing with insects. So it's good to know a lot about it. Um, let me give you just a little bit of um, my background as far as entomology. Like, I, I guess most kids, I loved bugs when I was little. Children are fascinated by insects. And fortunately, my mother was a biology major. Mm. So she did not discourage my interest. And in, she encouraged me to catch them and study them and learn about them. And, and then I got into 4 H. And uh, one thing about 4 H is it's got different kinds of projects for different kids. And most of my colleagues in 4-H, most of my kid friends lived out in the country. But I lived one block away from City Hall in mm -hmm. Conroe. And so I couldn't have cows and donkeys and, and acreage. But entomology was something that I could, I could do. So it became one of my main projects. And I... I stayed interested in it, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my interest in, in just a second. But um, I, So I have been interested in entomology for 70 years at least. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about something that happened to me when I was in, in high school. My, my big thing in high school was speech and debate. And it kind of, I kind of hit a crossroads between my 4-H and, and my speech and debate stuff in school. I was doing the 4-H entomology contest and uh, we have this big event in the summer called Roundup, which is, it's at A&M and it's different kinds of contests. And I was on an entomology team with two boys from uh, Montgomery County. And I, I was also, at that time, doing, keeping a record book for entomology, which I had turned, you turn those things in uh, yearly. Well, I was at Roundup, and I was getting ready to take the state entomology exam in this big amphitheater kind of a room. And of course, everybody's all socially distanced in that room. And started, started the test. And this gentleman walked in, and he looked around and he talked to the guy who was running the contest. And then he climbed up and, and came over to me and he asked me who I was. And I was who he was looking for. And he said, I judged your record book at the state contest last year. I, I hadn't placed that year. And he said, this is what I want you to do. He said, you are up against boys from South Texas that are applying insecticides to thousands of acres. He said, you can't do that. I want you to develop a, what we call in 4-H, a method demonstration, a little speech kind of thing. And I, I want you to do a method demonstration on safety with insecticides. And I want you to give that speech everywhere you can. And let that be the thing that makes you different from everyone else in the entomology contest next year when you turn in your record. I thanked him for his, his advice, 
And then he left and I went on and took my test. Good news is I, my team placed first in the state and I was high point individual. Wow. So that, that was a, a very, very amazing day. Well, I, when I got home, I, I thought about what he had told me to do, and I did it. My, my father built me a, a box that I could put uh, examples of insecticides in, empty bottles, of course, that with a locking front panel. And I went to every 4-H club, every Lions club, every Rotary club, every what we call home demonstration club in that I must have given that speech 20 times. Everybody who would listen. <laughs> and, 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 and then uh, I was also doing speech and debate in, in high school. And I was in what's called extemporaneous speaking, which is where you, you go in, you draw three topics you pick one and you have 30 minutes to give a speech. So I had advanced to the state contest. I was in Austin. I went to pull my, I went to pull my, my topics. One of those topics, what is the great debate about insects and insecticides? Oh, no, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lord was looking after you. I, I went, I, I went heck ho. 30 minutes later, walked in, gave my 4-H speech. Of course, I didn't have my props with me. But I gave my 4-H speech, and I won state. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Now, now, why, you ask, did that topic come up? Here's why. In 1962, a lady by the name of Rachel Carson, who had the unique talent of being a scientist who could really communicate with the public, wrote a book called Silent Spring. It was truly the beginning of the environmental movement in the entire United States. It was a bestseller. And it brought a new concept to most of the people who read it, and that was that insecticides have long-range, wide consequences that we need to be aware of. It was primarily the story of how DDT was killing off birds. If I could give you homework for this course, reading that book would be my homework for you. Of course, it, it's, it was in 1962, so you have to keep that in mind as you read it. A lot has changed. But if, you kind of, if you're interested in the environment, and you want to know how it came to be that most people are at least somewhat aware that we have the ability to do good or harm with chemicals, that's the book to read. And of course, that book was a hot topic at just the right time for me. So that's that's kind of where where I'm coming from as as my interest and my dedication to to insects. And every master gardener that I know of finds some part of the program that they that they're the most interested in. We're, we're not all alike in what we want to learn more about and what we want to do. Uh, and that's a good thing for our, for our whole program, to have people who will do this, that, and the other is a great strength for our program. Today, we're going we're gonna to cover these main ideas, and we will be taking a few breaks at an appropriate time, but we're going to cover, first of all, what an insect is. Then we're going to look at, in a bug's life, we're going to look at how they go from egg to adult and how their life cycles work. All in the Family introduces you to how we classify 
insects into the different kinds that we deal with. Friends, fellas, and foes is really aimed at your interest as a gardener. What you, as a grower of plants, are going to need the most to know about, about dealing with the insects you encounter. And then integrated pest management uh, will be a very important topic and, and IPM. Um, if, if you come to, to classes uh, with AgriLife, you can't, you can't go to three or four classes without hearing something about IPM. It's just a big deal. So that's, that's what we're going to definitely cover. Okay, what is an insect? Insects, well, all, all animals are broken down into what are called phylum, big, big, big groups of organisms. The phylum that happens to include our insects is the phylum Arthropoda. And if you look at what that word means, arthro means jointed, and poda refers to foot. So these are animals with jointed feet, okay? It includes a lot of familiar critters. It includes centipedes and millipedes. It includes crustaceans. It includes arachnids. And it includes insects. Now, of all of these, of course, the insects are much more abundant. And it is not rare for a, an entomologist to know quite a bit about some of these other groups without actually specializing in them. So that, that's why if I'm, if I'm the resident entomologist and you ask me a spider question, I, I'm probably going to have a pretty good idea what the answer is. Okay? Now. A little quick activity here. Uh, you, have a, you have a blank piece of paper, don't you? Mm -hmm. All right. On that blank piece of paper, I want you to draw the side view of a grasshopper. Just imagine that you are looking at a grasshopper. <laughs> you're, you're looking at him from the side. I want you to draw his picture. I want you to make it as detailed as you can. Okay, you don't have to label it, but, but please include everything that you can recall about what a, what a grasshopper looks like. You've got two minutes. Go. Here we go. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you can do is look at your picture and see if your insect has basically got three parts to their body. A head, okay, everybody got a head on here? Okay, everybody got a head, good. A middle part, which we call a thorax, and an abdomen. the body divided into three parts is a really important insect characteristic. Okay? If it only had two parts to its body, it might be a spider. It wouldn't be an insect. Okay? Alright? We might ask, well, what is the function of each one of these body parts? We might look at the head first, and on the head, did you give your did you give mm -hmm. your critter some eyes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you give your critter mm -hmm. some antenna? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, good. I forgot the antenna. <laughs> did you give it a mouth? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you give it a nose? No. Good, because they don't have a nose. Oh, good. <laughs> no, no nose. Mm -mm. No. 
All right, the thorax. That's where everything that has to do with movement is going to be fastened on. The thorax actually has three portions. And each one of those portions has a set of legs. Check with the legs on the abdomen. <laughs> And each one of those legs has got several parts to it. And since I asked you to grow a grasshopper, maybe maybe the last leg, maybe you drew the last leg bigger than the others. Maybe maybe you did that. Did you at least give him six legs? I got four. Yeah, I got six. Four. Six legs. He had an accident. Six legs. Well, yeah, they will fall off. Well, they might pull them off. They will fall off. But, but every insect will start out with six legs. I didn't even give mine a thorax. We just got a body. A head well, and a body. Well, you got a lot to learn. But that's okay. A lot. That's okay. A lot to learn. Now, a lot of insects have wings. They don't all have wings. It's not a requirement. But a lot of them do, when they're adults, have wings. And the ones that have wings, most of them have two sets. And they're going to have one set that fastens on, and I'm, I'm going to, they're really oh, probably a lot bigger than that, but the forewing fastens on to the middle segment of the thorax, and the second wing or hind wing fastens on to the last one. Wow. Sometimes that means that this very front segment kind of stands out from the rest. So some insects also don't have that second set of wings. They only have one pair. That's the flies. Mm. And I guess it's a matter of balance. They have a little, a little balancer thing back here, but the, the wing is really located there, I guess, in the kind of the center of mass of the thing so it flies well. So the thorax has a lot to do with locomotion. The abdomen also has a bunch of little segments. Five or six would be common. Along the side of the abdomen and also up on the thorax, there are some little, they're like little portholes on the side. They're for breathing. Remember, it didn't have a nose. Okay, how's it get air? Those little portholes on the side are how it gets air. Okay? And of course, on the very end of the body down here, we're going to have various structures that have to do with reproduction. Um, structures that help the animal lay eggs. Structures that help the male hold on to the female. Um, so the tip end is, is a busy little spot right there. <laughs> Plus, of course, the anus. <laughs> the anus is down there, too. So. Other than that, the abdomen very often doesn't have a whole lot of distinguishing things going on. Now we've got the outside of the animal. You realize that we've actually, we've actually started looking at um, the systems of that animal's body as we've been, as we've been looking at that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look through a bunch of systems, but right here, what system are we looking at? I know we're looking at the whole animal, but what system are we actually seeing there? Turns out that you're seeing the skeletal system because insects don't have their skeleton on the inside with muscles attaching to the outside of bones like we do. Their hard structure is the surface, the outside. Their muscles attach to the inside. Our muscles attach to the outside of 
our skeleton. And they're just backwards to us. Now, the skeletal system is made of a totally different chemical from our skeletal system. It's called chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. Chitin, it's a basically indigestible material. And chitin, if it's thick, gets very rigid. If it's thin, it's flexible. So if you're looking at the body of an insect, if it's a real hard part, that means the chitin is very thick. If it's a joint that has to have flexibility to it, it's still that continuous sheet, but very thin, so it can move. Support of the body in ones that are hard comes from the rigid structure of that exterior. These ox beetles that I brought in, those things have been dead a while, mm -hmm. and they're still just hard as rock. You know, they happen to be an insect that has a very, very thick covering. But if, if I had brought in, I had a wonderful caterpillar about, well, it was last Sunday. A caterpillar is all squishy, right? Mm -hmm. That's because the chitin is thin. So an insect can be rigid and crunchy, or they can be squishy, but they're all covered by this exoskeleton, exoskeleton, because it's on the outside. Now one thing that this creates, a problem that this creates, is growth. It is very hard to get bigger when your exterior is like a suit of armor. You pretty much have to take it off, and that's what insects have to do. They have enzymes that dissolve the innermost layer of their exoskeleton, which then they can crawl out of. Good, come on in. And we call that molting. And because an insect has to, has to do that, uh, and it's because it's very difficult, that gives us, as, as gardeners, that gives us a little opportunity, which we'll meet later on. Now we're going to consider the nervous system the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the digestive system, and the reproductive system, because those are mostly the things that, as gardeners, you're going to interact with. We're going to start with the nervous system. Um, you can probably, yeah, you can cut the, you can cut the light off, I think, for a while. Damien, are you going to be able to see? Stuff that I brought Damn, in. You can sit here if you want to. I don't buy. I don't think he can feel the board from where that is. Yeah, I don't think that's going to help. You much. can sit over here. I'm I, I think probably yeah. over here would be yeah, the, bad angle. the best. Thank you. I didn't want to interrupt. I want you to appreciate uh, some of the pictures that I've got. Uh, I, I have a new Facebook friend, and he's into macro photography, and he loves to take pictures of insects up close. But I, so I borrowed a few pictures from him, and I want you to just look at this fly. It illustrates, for one thing, that flies are very fuzzy. You may not realize how many little bristles there are on a fly, and every one of those little bristles has a nerve that goes to it. It's like a cat's whisker. You know, they're aware of everything. And then look at the facets of the compound eye. How many little portions this eye is. Each one of those 
facets is like its own unique eye pointed in one certain direction. And because the surface of that eye is so convex, each one of those pointed in a slightly different direction. If something moves across the world, that fly sits there and different facets of that eye are stimulated. That eye may not be as good as ours for seeing images, but it is outstanding for seeing motion. And if you've ever tried to swat flies, <laughs> you know that they're very good at anticipating that. Uh, it takes a lot of skill to swat flies. And usually, <laughs> people who are good at it have figured out that if you come straight at him, you have a better shot than if you come at him from the side. Now, why? Because if you come at him straight, you're stimulating the same parts of his eye instead of different ones. So you're going to learn a lot of useful information today. <laughs> the nervous system of an insect consists of a brain. Yes, they have a brain in their head. And from that brain, you're going to have little nerves. And the biggest nerves run along the bottom of the body with a little bit of extra nerve tissue at every segment. And notice that it kind of makes a, a loop up here in the head. Nerves of insects use very similar chemicals to our own. It's not a whole different set of chemicals. Why, as gardeners, is that important? What's toxic to well, them is toxic to us. Bingo. Bad for them is bad for us. That's right. If there is something that is going to affect their nervous system and is toxic to them, there's a real good chance that it's also toxic to us. If it is toxic because it affects nerves, then we've got to watch out for it. On the other hand, if it's a chemical that, that is toxic to them in some other way, then maybe it's not as toxic to us. But there are a number of very toxic substances that attack their nervous system. If if you like to spray bugs, like with Raid, and you like to watch them fall and twitch, then you're, you're using nerve poisons. One of the most lethal chemicals that we ever used on insects was nicotine. Now, tell me that organic substances are safe. Uh-uh. Nicotine was extremely, extremely dangerous to use. So dangerous that you can't go buy it anymore. They took it off the market. It too great a hazard. But boy, did it work. You know? So, the nervous system of an insect, highly developed, uses most of the same chemicals that ours does, but is located in a different area of the body. Located on the bottom side, ours is located on the top side. Includes a lot of sense organs, senses that, uh, senses that go to the antenna, help, help the insect know which way the breeze is blowing, literally. An insect can tell which way the breeze is blowing by the pressure on its antenna. Bees are especially good at that. Um, eyesight, chemoreceptors, taste, smell, and many insects have an audio system as well. So, very good nervous system. Circulatory system, 
from that alien. This is really different from what you've got. Your circulatory system includes your heart. When, when the heart pumps, it drives the blood out through arteries that branch and branch until finally it gets to the very tiniest blood vessels. What are they called? Capillaries. Yes, yeah. capillaries. <laughs> And then after the blood has been through the capillaries, the, the walls of the capillary are so thin that chemicals can pass pretty easily. But then the blood starts to be gathered up into veins that eventually dump that blood back into the heart so it can go round again. Never in this plan do we have blood just oozing through your body. Not unless you've received a traumatic injury are you going to have blood that's not contained. That's why we call our systems a closed system. Insects don't have that at all. Their system is what's called an open system. They have a fluid. We'll, today we'll call it blood. But that blood is literally just loose inside the body. There's a heart that pumps the blood. The heart is a tube near the top of the body. It's open on each end, and it's got holes down the side. Blood goes in these holes. They shut. The pump squeezes. The blood squirts out toward the front and toward the back bathes all of the internal organs and eventually winds up in the neighborhood of the heart and around it goes again. Oh. You splattered a bug on your windshield, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Liquid everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Is it red? It's green or yellow. Yeah. Their blood isn't the same color as ours because it has a slightly different job to do. Our blood is red because of certain cells that are in our blood, and we call them da -da, red blood cells, okay? What's their job? What do your red cells do? The role of the erythrocyte, what, what is that? What is it? Oxygen. Yeah, carry oxygen. Carry oxygen. Their blood's not responsible for carrying oxygen. It's not its job. Okay? It's gonna, gonna carry oxygen another way. So they don't have red blood cells. They don't have red blood. They don't have hemoglobin, the chemical that makes blood red. Don't have it. Don't need it. Okay? Their blood is responsible for picking up waste. It's responsible for carrying digested food around. It does those things like ours does. Um, carries hormones, all that stuff. Just, just doesn't deal with gases, doesn't deal with blood gases. It's different. Uh, there are copper, copper compounds in that blood. That's why it gets the greenish or yellowish color. Not, not iron, which is our red color. So, the, the hemolymph, or blood, does all of that and helps maintain pressure. It's like, a, an insect would be like an, a tire that has gone flat if it didn't have enough blood in it. It, it would literally deflate if you're if you're ever just feeling diabolical when you're out in your garden and you've caught you a big caterpillar that has just eaten your favorite tomato, <laughs> instead of just squishing him, take your little $10 nippers and just cut a little hole. Start, stuff starts oozing out, oozing out, and as it oozes out, that whole insect just kind of deflates. You have just interrupted his circulatory system. Yeah. It'll feel good if he ate your favorite tomato. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
I, I did that a couple of times, and the Cardinals started watching me, and they started coming in and getting those getting those things before they were completely deflated. It was pretty cool to watch. <laughs> now, another thing that we talk about later on is how insects pump out their wings when they emerge as adults. That happens because of the hemolymph being pumped into those wings, oh, okay. spread them out, and then, then they harden, and then there's the hemolymph is withdrawn. If you ever have a chance to watch that, do it. The respiratory system. Now, I said the blood is not responsible for moving oxygen around. Doesn't mean they don't need oxygen. They certainly do. But they've got these little portholes down the side of the thorax and the abdomen, and those little portholes are called spiracles. They let air into the body, and the air goes into a system of passageways. And they're called trachea, which is easy to remember because our windpipe is trachea also. I, I sure wish I had that caterpillar that we found this weekend because its skin was so thin that you could actually see from the spiracles, you could see this little branching network of little white lines going everywhere. Oh, grub worms are real good for being able to see through their skin. Sometimes you can even watch the the blood pump, you can see the heartbeat through the skin. The digestive system concerns us a lot. The digestive system of an insect always starts with a mouth and ends with an anus, but what's in between varies just a bit. First of all, the mouth. This is very much going to vary with what the diet is. If it is an insect that has what we call chewing mouth parts, they're going to be jaws. Their jaws operate side to side, not up and down like ours. No, their jaws are side to side. That allows them to sit on the edge of a leaf and go munch, 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 munch. Munch, 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 munch. Munch, 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 munch. Works great. But a lot of insects don't have chewing mouth parts. They have the same basic parts but modified into other shapes. And one common shape is two pieces that fit together with a very sharp point. Piercing, sucking mouth parts for sticking into the body of either a plant and sucking juice or into the body of an animal and sucking blood. So we have chewing mouth parts, piercing sucking mouth parts, lapping mouth parts, sponging mouth parts, and then like the butterflies, the long siphoning mouth parts. So quite a variety of how we're going to get food in what are we going to do with it once we've got it? If you're, if you're chewing and you're ingesting large volumes of plant matter, you're going to need a digestive system with all kinds of stomachs and gizzards and grinding areas and processing areas. If you're taking in a liquid diet, you don't need all of that. Pretty much a straight tube, front to rear. Eventually you get into a long intestine before you get to the anus. All of the insects that, that I'm aware of are going to have some sort of salivary gland in, in the head area. But what that saliva is for varies just a little bit. The insects that have a blood diet the salivary glands are able to produce a stuff that keeps blood from clotting. That way they can bite 
and then they can suck all the blood they want. Many insects are going to express a little bit of saliva no matter how they feed. Now, why might that cause us some problems? That the insects are spitting on you or spitting on your plants as they're eating. Disease. Disease. Insects are often vectors for diseases. Animal diseases and plant diseases. Mm. Things like viruses and bacterial diseases are often spread by insects. And a lot of that goes to the fact that they have these salivary glands, that they are spitting a little bit and then sucking a bunch of stuff back up or spitting on it and then eating it and then going to the next thing and doing the same. Some parasites live within the body and actually have part of their life cycle moving from different parts of the insect but eventually back to the salivary glands so they can reinfect the next victims. So the digestive system gives us a lot of uh, things to think about not only as a gardener but but actually you know as for public health. You know, we're looking at picking up uh, mosquitoes now because we're interested in a particular disease. Uh, if, if mosquitoes didn't bite twice and spit on everybody, we wouldn't worry about that. We wouldn't have it. <laughs> Reproductive system. Um, with really only one important exception, insects reproduce by Male mates with female, female lays eggs, life continues. Um, males, male insects, female insects very, uh, very often look a little bit different. Um, as you look at these big old beetles here, there's two, two boys and a girl in that, in that pan there. There's, you can look and see if you can find the difference. Um, can you think of one instance of an insect that gives live virgin birth? Aphids. Aphids. Very often found in big colonies, right? She's just not making babies, she's cloning herself. Yeah, you don't find one aphid. Okay. Um, Let's take about a five minute break, real quick break. There's, there's not many here, so we don't have... Okay, so we're going to be talking about metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a change in appearance during growth and maturation. If you have ever been the one to explain to a little child that a caterpillar becomes a butterfly and the amazement of a little kid when they finally decide that you're telling them the truth <laughs> well that's that's the the amazement of insects is how they are organized to change in appearance as they grow and mature it's not an easy thing because, as I told you, they're hard on the outside. And in order to grow, they have to molt. They have to shed that skin. Shedding of skin or molting is technically called ecdysis. Ecdysis. Uh, None of you have probably ever made a living at being an ecdiocist. <laughs> that would be a striptease. <laughs> so, ecdysis is something that insects go through usually five or six times during their lives. And in between this shedding event, that period of time is called an instar. So, a tiny newly hatched caterpillar just comes out of its eggshell. That's the first instar larva. 
and then it sheds, and it's the second instar larva, and then it sheds, and it grows and grows until finally that last molt, it becomes an adult. At that point, it's through growing, and it probably, typical insects, it doesn't have much longer to live. But that's why if you see a little bitty beetle, mm -hmm. It's not a baby big beetle. That's as big as it's ever going to be. Okay? A little butterfly doesn't turn in to a big butterfly. A big caterpillar turns into a big butterfly. There's a growth time there. This shedding of the skin is under hormonal control. And the hormone that does this event of building a new skin and breaking out and that is a chemical that is not similar to anything in our own bodies. And that's a good thing. Why have we made use of this knowledge that it's hormones that drive the metamorphosis? If we can come up with a chemical that blocks that regulation. What happens to the insect? It's a bear. It's a bear. That, they can't get any bigger. They're done. They can get older, but they can't get bigger. Mm -hmm. If you are using a control product that includes IGR, Insect Growth Regulator, it is a way to interrupt the life cycle by interfering with metamorphosis. The nice thing about it, chemicals like IGRs are non-toxic to anything except insects. So that's a good thing. When we look at how the insect is growing up, there are several plans of how to go from egg to adult. The easiest way is called simple or gradual or incomplete metamorphosis. And it starts out with an insect laying an egg, the egg hatches into a tiny little insect that's similar, not the same, but similar to what it's going to be when it's full grown. And we call that little insect a nymph. The nymph eats, sheds its skin, grows, eats, sheds its skin, grows, eats, sheds its skin, grows. And that last time it sheds its skin is when the wings become apparent. As long as it's a nymph, Internally, it won't have a reproductive system, and externally, it won't have wings. And it may change colors gradually, and of course, it's going to change difference in size a little bit. But it's still not unreasonable to see that this can grow into that. Okay? That's simple or incomplete metamorphosis, egg, nymph, adult. More complicated metamorphosis is called complete. And that's where we go from an egg to a feeding stage called a larva. And the larva can have a lot of different um, names depending on what kind of insect we're talking about. But it's going to be the feeding stage and when it gets through eating and growing and shedding and eating and growing and shedding, it's going to go into a period called the pupa. The pupal stage is a period of reorganization within the body. Because when it molts that last time and comes out as an adult, it may look nothing like what it looked like before. That's where we're going from the caterpillar to the butterfly. So very drastic reorganization. The 
chemical guidance of what is going on inside the body is amazing because tissues have to be broken down the, the substances within those cells have to be reused and recycled and built into new structures that were never there before. A lot can go wrong during that period of time. But most of the time everything goes right and it comes out and it's a, and it's a perfect adult. And so that's your complete metamorphosis. Egg, larva, pupa, adult. This, this last metamorphosis stage can be an amazing thing to watch whether it is a cicada which they're coming out right now and you can they come out they are, they're in the ground for years and then they come out and they cling to something and when they come out that last stage for about the first hour they are lime green and then they darken into the, the kind of drab, camouflaged adults that we've seen everywhere all our lives. Or a moth from coming out of that cocoon to here, that's one hour. Now look at the abdomen, how big it is. That's full of blood that's going to be pumped into the veins of the wings to spread them out. Sometimes people try to raise butterflies or moths indoors, let the kids see and all that, and they have them in a little bitty container. And if they don't have room for those wings to spread out right there in that first hour, and they harden all wadded up, nothing can be done about that. They have to have space. A pretty amazing thing. A basic principle that we have in biology is that form follows function. When you see all of the different ways that insects look and make their living, you can you can see this idea in action. And look at that, look at that moth right there. That moth is a little bit unusual because we usually think about moths as being active at night. Uh, that kind is active at twilight and has a really long tongue, a really long proboscis. And that moth right there can do something that most moths can't do. It's, it can hover. It can hover, it can fly backwards, forwards, up, down, all of that. Why is it able to do that? The way that moth right there happens to be built, it can take those wings and do this with them. And that's what it takes to be able to hover. Does that remind you of, of any other kind of animal that can do that? A hummingbird. A hummingbird, same size same ability. A hummingbird can fly any direction and hover. All right? Form follows function. Feeding strategies for insects. If it can be eaten, there is an insect that will eat it. <laughs> uh, a lot of the ones that as gardeners we are concerned about are what the environmentalist is going to call a primary consumer. A primary consumer is something that eats plants. So as gardeners we care about this bunch of insects a lot. Another word for primary consumer is herbivore. Okay. Now some of the insects that we are concerned about here eat solids, others eat liquids. The ones that eat solids eat leaves, fruit, flowers, wood. The ones that eat liquids are sucking plant sap. Secondary consumers, 
Another name for that is carnivores. Secondary consumers eat things that eat primary consumers. So these are animals that eat animals. The insects that eat animals, some of them are predators. They hunt and kill. Others are parasites living on or in the body of a host. And then we have a good many insects that serve as decomposers or saprophytes living in places like our, our compost heap, helping things break down, helping minerals return to soil. All of those feeding strategies are, are equally important. Imagine, for example, that we did not have the decomposers and saprophyte insects. We'd have a mess. We would have a mess. Uh, some of the most important insects agriculturally are the dung beetles. Imagine what cow pastures would be like <laughs> if all of those cow patties just accumulated and didn't get broken apart, buried, and recycled. That wouldn't be good. So every one of these steps along the chain is important. Another thing that is important is how insects overwinter. That is one of our little native bees. And there are a lot of different overwintering strategies that insects have to use. Um, about. As an overwintering strategy, can you think of anything that insects do to make sure that they're still around next year? Sleep. Sleep. Hibernate, basically. Hide. We don't have very many insects that are up and actively feeding during the winter time. Most of them have found some way to be inactive for that period of time. Um, something to realize is if you are concerned about wasps, mm -hmm. okay? Let's say that right now you're concerned because you're seeing big nests of paper wasps mm -hmm. here and there. I had a, an air conditioner issue uh, this last week because there were a bunch of paper wasp nests inside of an air conditioner. It got everything all stopped up and it started to drain wrong and I ended up with water all over the floor of, a, of a, my art room. Huh, I wasn't happy. Well, is that whole big nest going to be active all winter? No. no. A young queen, that's all. And she will already have mated. All the rest of those wasps were going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. In the spring, along about February, that young queen already mated will be out looking for a place to build her nest. It better not be in my air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> um, honeybees and ants are the only colonial insects that overwinter everybody. The rest of them get it down to one female if it's an adult. Now, a lot of insects go through the wintertime as some sort of juvenile stage. They overwinter as eggs, or they overwinter as pupa, a resting stage. Um, not very many of them overwinter as adults, but some do. Um, do you know what the expression garden hygiene means? <laughs> uh, garden hygiene means in the fall, Clean up all the leftover plants in your, in your yard, in your vegetable garden. Um, 
put it where it needs to be, whether that's in the compost heap or on the curb, get rid of it. Don't have big piles of uh, leftover plant material um, hanging around. Why? Because that's where insects spend the winter. Um, you don't like squash bugs? If you use good garden hygiene, you'll have fewer of them. Not none, just fewer. The flip side of this, of course, is that if you are trying to encourage native insects, if you are trying to have a pollinator garden, uh, if you are trying to encourage native bees, then garden hygiene is something that you need to not do much of because those same plants that are sometimes unsightly and might be where the bad guys are spending the winter, it's also where the good guys are spending the winter. Uh, so, as A, as pupa, as adults, that's, that's where they are. Why not as nymphs? Why not as larvae? Simply because when it's cold, there's not much to eat, those would not be good ways to spend the winter. All in the family, identifying insects. I'm on, I guess, three different Facebook pages that have to do with insects. And I will tell you that 90% of the time the issue is, what kind of insect is this? And people will send it a picture. It's as if we don't really care about the insects as soon as we've got a name on them. Um, what kind of insect is this? Um, as gardeners, that's certainly the place we need to start. If you don't know what kind of insect it is, you don't know whether to worry about it or not, right? So. Insect identification is a big deal. Three questions that are answered as, by a scientist, by an entomologist trying to identify an insect. The first question is, what kind of metamorphosis did this insect go through? Um, most of the time when we're presented with an insect and somebody wants it identified, it is, it is usually an adult. Not always, but usually. And the first question is going to be, did it grow up through egg nymph adult, or did it go up, grow up egg larva pupa adult? Uh, unfortunately, if you're not pretty familiar with insects, you can't look at an adult and know. So even though this is a very important question, it's not a really helpful question. A much more helpful question is, what are the wings like? Does it have wings? How many wings? Um, are they this way? Are they that way? Are they the other way? Uh, what are the wings like? Usually we can figure out, um, might take a magnifying glass, but usually not, what they're like. What are the mouth parts like? Can you see the mouth? Can you see what the mouth parts are shaped like? If you can tell me what the wings are like and what the mouth is like, I can usually tell you what order of insects we're dealing with. And that's the first step in classifying. Let's look at some of the more common orders. There are about 20 different orders of insects. Most of the Insects that you're likely to encounter as a gardener are in about eight or ten of them. This is, this is a couple of orders that are really important. Some modern books try to put these two orders together. They're very similar. Hemiptera and Homoptera. These are the Insects that are similar to a cicada and the true bugs. Both of these orders, Homoptera and Hemiptera, 
you look at the name of it, that P-T-E-R-A, do you, do you know what that root word might mean? That's wing. Wing. So, homoptera, same wing. This is a group of insects that the wings are the same texture, top to bottom, front to back. The wings look the same. Hemi means half. These insects have wings that are half very, uh, very thick, leathery, and the tip end is more delicate. So Hemiptera and Homoptera. These two groups both grow up using that, that primitive, that gradual or simple way, egg, nymph, adult. And they have piercing, sucking mouth parts. Homopterans include cicadas. Um, cicadas kind of in the news right now. We do not have in Texas many, if any, of the kind of cicada that lives 17 years. Uh, that's really a more, more eastern kind. But there is a kind of cicada that lives, suck, they suck this, the sap out of tree roots. So they're underground until that last month of their life when they come out and scream a lot and then lay their eggs and die. This is the 17th year. So back east, and I think the screaming is almost over, but um, back east, this is the year of the locust. And you can count, it's just regular as clockwork. It's every 17 years. There's also one that goes 13 years, and there's some that go five years and three years, and different lengths of time for these different insects. There's so many cicadas in Texas that live so many different years. There's so many different breeds. We have cicadas every summer. But in back east, it's definitely a cyclical thing. I was in Washington, D.C. one year that just coincidentally that was the year and that was the month and uh, it was amazing. Just I'd always read about it, you know. But to hear it and to see tree limbs, just twigs, everywhere. And in the morning you couldn't walk down the sidewalks under the trees. So many tip ends had been cut off that night and they'd be out there sweeping them all up. And then tomorrow there's going to be that many more. I mean, it's just all the trees get pruned. And every 17th year, it goes like that. Is that the noise we hear in the evenings all the time? Oh, uh, a lot of it in the middle of the summertime, too. Yeah. And that high pitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you ever catch them and you hold them just right and squeeze them in just the right place, you can make them scream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Little kids, good at that. Hemiptera includes a lot more different kinds than, than the homoptera. Some of these guys are, are real small. And you've brought an example today, your little mealybug thing. Hemipterans range all the way from very, very small up to this, this guy. This is our largest hemiptera that we would find around here. What is it? That is called a giant water bug. They, they're aquatic, <laughs> but they're also very much attracted to lights at night, so we see them around, um, around street lamps and barns and porches. And they're about two inches long. Look at the front legs on that thing. Like it gives you a clue how they, you know, what they eat. Those guys are predators. Mm. They'll go after a little, little tiny fish, and they'll go after tadpoles. Mm. Um, and if you pick them up and you're not careful, they'll bite you, mm. just in self-defense. But uh, an, old, an old common name of this thing, uh, toe biters. 
<laughs> toe biters. I guess that goes back to when we used to let little kids run around barefoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That thing down there, you might recognize that as a stink bug. Yeah. There are many kinds of stink bugs. I some, they were some greener. A I lot of kinds of, a lot there. of kinds of stink bugs are green, mm -hmm. green, gray, brown, lots of different colors. That one right there happens to be an invasive species that we're on the watch for right now, and that's called a brown marmonated stink bug. I never had heard the word marmonated until uh, like four years ago. It means marbled, uh, and it, it describes that kind of a modeled pattern to there. They're a, they're a re, they're an Asian insect that's gotten to the United States like so many other plant pests have gotten over here, and uh, and now we're having now we're having trouble with them. So. That's the insect that you brought in. Oh. Yeah. What is it? That is one of the Reduvian bugs. That is, it's an assassin bug. It's a predator. Oh, wow. All right. It's a predator. And uh, a good example in that picture, you can see how the wings of this hemipteran, the left wing and the right wing, the way they're held, they're kind of overlapping each other at the tip and when they do that you kind of see an X pattern right mm -hmm. when you're looking at an insect and you see that X pattern on the back you are almost guaranteed to be looking at a hemiptera because these insects are sucking some of them are a little harder to control than insects that bite and swallow a lot of plant material. If, if you have an insect that gobbles down a whole lot of plant material, you put some kind of insecticide on the plant, they're bound to get some. But if the way the insect gets its food is to poke a hole and suck from way down inside that tomato, you know, it's a little bit harder to, to control insects with sucking mouth parts. So some of these guys give us trouble, and then some of them are our friends. Some of them are predators. Is he a bad guy or a good guy? Huh? Bad guy or a good guy? Good guy. Well, you know, no, well, well now wait, let, yeah. let me step back. The gardener in me says good guy. Mm -hmm. The environmentalist says there's no such thing as good bad. Gotcha. Yeah. But as gardener, I'm going to say good guy. Order Orthoptera. Ortho means straight. These guys have straight wings. They, they grow up gradually. They have that gradual metamorphosis from egg to nymph to adult. But they've got chewing mouth parts. Here we have insects that most of us don't care to be around. We have all of our roaches our crickets, and our grasshoppers. As a gardener, as a homeowner, um, these, are good. these are bad guys, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, straight wings. They have a lot of modifications that can be interesting, like a grasshopper's hind legs. So good for jumping. This cricket right here, look at the front legs. That's a mole cricket. If you ever go out in your garden, if, you're, if the soil in your garden is sandy, and you see this little, looks like something has been burrowing right under the surface, mm -hmm. but the little trail is only about that wide, and it just runs this way and that way, and you, you dig around in it, and it, something has gone through there, but it couldn't have been very big. That's a mole cricket. Uh, if you only have a few of them, don't worry about it. Okay? If you have a lot of them, then that's a problem. They're interesting little critters when you catch them. Lepidoptera. Everybody loves Lepidoptera. Okay? 
until the caterpillars happen to be eating something that you're trying to grow. Lepidoptera includes moths and butterflies. And yes, there's a difference, but um, all, all, all butterflies are moths, not all moths are butterflies. So all of these go through the egg, larva, pupa, adult. We've now gotten into the more advanced insects that go through the complete metamorphosis and we generally call the larva of a lepidopteran, we call it a caterpillar. We can call it a larva, it is a larva, but we call it a caterpillar. When it goes into the pupa stage, if it's going to be a moth, there's a good chance that it's going to spin a silk container around its pupa stage, and we call that a cocoon. Now, they don't all do that. Some, like that sphinx moth that I showed you, that one doesn't spin a cocoon, it just buries itself. It's just down in the ground uh, an inch or two. Butterflies don't spin a cocoon around themselves, but sometimes they will attach themselves to a branch with just one little piece of silk. So all of them have some ability to spin a silk-like material. It's only really well developed in some of the big moths. Coleoptera. Coleo means shield. These are the shield wings. These are the beetles. Now the way a beetle's wings work, I wish I had a a great big ox beetle that was alive to show you this. It doesn't seem, looking like them, that they even have wings. The body looks like it's completely armored, but they have four wings. The front two aren't for flying. They are simply to, to protect the body, and they meet and so you see a line right down the center of the back where the left side, right side wings meet together. You see the front se segment of the thorax by itself here and then you see the front wings hard meeting together making like a shell. The hind wing is for flying. It is twice as long as the insect is from here to there. And you know the, the what was it, a DeLorean? The, the car where the, 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 uh, the doors went up like this to get in, uh, back to the future, yeah. you know? That's how those front wings act when the insect needs to fly. He takes those front wings, props them up like this, takes the hind wings, and they're hinged right in the middle. He's got them tight, tight up behind himself like this. And sticks them out like that, and flies. When he lights, puts them away, folds them up, and then puts that top cover down on top of them. Every now and then, they don't get it perfectly organized. <laughs> Look at, you know, turn your porch light on, get some June bugs. Yeah. Look at them. Every now and then, you'll see one that's got a little bit of wing hanging out. He just didn't get himself put back together quite properly. Mm -hmm. They're good flyers, most of them. But when you look at them, you think, well, that, that, how's that insect fly? But that's, they fly with those back wings. The larva of a beetle is called a grub, and whether it's the grub or the adult, they're going to be chewing mouth parts on these guys. They're going to eat solid food. Sometimes that's a problem. Do you know what this, this guy here is? They're about the same size, this guy and that guy. They're about the same size. 
And you might see either one of them in your vegetable garden. You probably know what this one is. What is that? That's a light beetle. But what is that guy up there? That kind of yellowish green. I've never seen that. That guy is your 12 spotted cucumber beetle. <laughs> also known as the corn root worm. That is one of the worst little pests that you can have in your vegetable garden. They love to eat baby plants just as they sprout, especially anything in the cucurbit family. So that's your, your sprouting cucumbers and squash and melons when they're real tiny. Those things are bad, bad on them. And they continue to be bad on your vegetables throughout their growing life. It wouldn't be so bad if they just ate some of them, but they carry diseases. They carry virus diseases from plant to plant. So you really don't want to see those in your garden. Um, Are they common here in this area? Yeah, very common. Very common. But what's the answer? What are they using to read? Um, they're, they're not too hard to control. Um, in the garden, there are a lot of considerations of what you use in the garden, uh, in, including whether or not it's toxic to bees, and if it is, when do you put it out? Um, seven is a, a, a common insecticide to use for things like that. Uh, I, I learned a long time ago, because I have a small garden, you know. I, I learned that the easiest way to control some insects is manual. Um, it took me a long time before I could take um, an insect and do that to it. I, I resisted that for a long time. Um, if, you, if you know that that would be the best thing to do if you just found one of something and you knew what it was, it was a bad guy, and you wanted it dead, if you could just grab it and squish it, um, practice on frozen peas. <laughs> uh, if you can, if you can take a frozen pea and do like that, you can do a, a southern corn rootworm, spotted cucumber beetle. As the name implies, it the grubs get after corn. So this is an all-around garden problem. Um, these guys. I mentioned uh, the 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 importance of dung beetles. There they are, male, female. Beautiful things. These are the scarabs. Uh, in, in Egypt, if you're into uh, Egyptology, the scarab, which was a sacred uh, thing in, in the uh, Egyptian history, is a scarab beetle. That one up there, mm -hmm. this one, that's called a fiery searcher. Fiery searcher or caterpillar hunter. This guy, you would be glad to see him in your garden. He's going to help you control your caterpillars. And of course, the lady beetle. Lady beetle is a whole new thing for some folks. Um, you know they eat aphids. You, basically, you know that. Do you know that their larvae eat more aphids than the adults do? The larvae of this insect looks like a it looks like a tiny little orange and black alligator and they will really um, effective predators on aphids and sometimes you'll have people call and they'll say oh I've got I've got aphids on my whatever and and, and there's also these these other bugs in there they're in there and they're they're orange and black and they're prickly and so, well, you know, you don't really have a problem. You have aphids and you have the <laughs> insects that are eating the aphids. Leave them alone. You know, they're taking care of the problem. Well, bugs are good bugs. Good bugs. Well, okay, once again, I'm going to say, as a gardener, I'm going to say, good bugs. Okay? Tell me what the yellow one was called again. That was the cucumber beetle. Hymenoptera. These are the bees, the wasps, the ants. Have you heard about murder hornets? Oh, good grief. 
do not worry about murder hornets, okay? Uh, yes, such a thing exists. Uh, did they find some in uh, around Vancouver? Yes. Are they likely to ever get to Texas? No. They probably won't even make it to California. Um, lots of lots of press. Not much. Not much reality. But because you know how Facebook is, they'll take something and pretty soon it's everywhere. Uh, there has been a dramatic increase in the questions being asked about cicada killers. Yes, those cicadas, there is a wasp that is a specialist that finds them, stings them, which paralyzes them. Then they take them down into their burrows, lay an egg on them, and that's the food for the, the baby wasp. One cicada is enough food to raise one cicada killer wasp. And they're, they're big, and they're, I guess, kind of scary looking, and they're not interested in anything except finding cicadas. They will fly into you, bounce off, and keep on going. Uh, you would have to grab one and squeeze him to make him, to make him sting you. Of course, if he did sting you, it would really hurt. Really hurt, yeah, but just leave him alone. Uh, fascinating insects to watch. It's hard for a wasp to carry a cicada that's as big as it is. They'll, they'll drag it up. They'll carry it up a tree trunk until they're six or eight feet in the ground, and then they'll, it almost a glide. They'll glide toward their burrow and then they'll climb up and then they'll glide down until eventually they'll get to where they're, where they're going. Paper wasps. Um, there's been some research done that indicates that there is a facial recognition system in those insects where they literally recognize individual people. If you've got a nest that is fairly close to your house and you've gone in and out a million times and you haven't bothered them, they get to where they don't even they don't even pay you any attention at all. Some stranger walks up and they're they're all about that. You know? Um, there there's more research to be done on these insects to figure out um, more things that we don't know. Um, of course, that's a bumblebee up there. Then there's there's honeybees. Maybe we won't have time to talk about. It. They're not going to have a whole separate class or anything on honeybees, are they? No. We might we might take some time to talk a little bit about honeybees. The 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 truth and the myth and the reality of of honeybees. Diptera. Die means two. So these guys have two wings, and only two wings. These are the flies, and it, that also includes mosquitoes. Some flies are a real problem to us humans because of their ability to carry diseases. Um, and and that, that, that's just an undeniable problem. But there are other flies that are, are good guys. Flies are also just amazing mimics. There are flies that look like other kinds of insects. Especially there are a lot of flies that, that do a wonderful job of pretending to be wasps. Look at that thing right there. First glance, looks like a wasp. No, count the wings, only two. Look at the eyes. Flies have these ginormous eyes, and they have small antenna. You look at that thing and it's like, that's not a wasp. That's a fly pretending to be a wasp. That guy's a predator. A more effective predator on aphids than lady beetles. Okay. When you meet an insect, and you want to know what it is. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Now you're master gardeners. What are you going to do? You see an insect, or 
even more, you don't see this insect. One of your friends calls you and said, hey, you're a master gardener. Come tell me what this insect is. I'll be right over. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right. When you get there, now what you going to do? Take a picture of it. Take Document a, it. Take a picture of it or collect it if, mm -hmm. if you can. Take a picture of it. Do you, do you know how to take a close up picture with your with your phone? Yeah. You know you know how to touch the screen well, and zoom in, and, zoom in and, and get a good focus on something that you're close up to. If if you if you don't know how to do that while we take a break, we'll somebody will show you how. Take a good picture. Nobody can identify insects from fuzzy pictures far away. Okay, so a good picture. Now what you, you, you got the insect itself, you got a picture. Uh, now what you gonna do? So well, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Give me about an hour. I won't okay. send it to you. You call me, <laughs> exactly. I, it's gonna be, it's either, I'm gonna either answer that question or I'm gonna say, give me an hour, all right? There's apps now you can put them in. That's what we just learned from one of our I, creatures. You know, I there is it. there are plant apps, and I know a little bit about how those things have been done and written, and sometimes they'll give you right answers. Sometimes, um, sometimes, <laughs> but so, you know, with insects, you would have asked that question just if you just didn't need to know the answer. So I'm I am not yet on board with never mind there's an app for that you know okay so what are you going to do with this insect that you've collected or this good picture that you've taken what are you going to do there you go call <laughs> novel images <laughs> <laughs> about half the that. master gardener <laughs> says like, all right send this to all and she'll tell you what it is and it, you know, it's, it's either I'm either going to tell you exactly what it is or I'm going to say, yeah, give me an hour. Okay? Um, Richard knows a lot. He's got a lot of resources. I know a lot. I've got a lot of resources. Uh, there is no reason for you to go, go days and days wondering what a particular insect is. We are here to help. Um, it is, we are not expecting you to yourself personally learn to recognize all 50,000 insects in North America, okay? But, but we do hope that you know how to get help when there is one that you seem to have a, a problem with, okay? Now, is that what that, in that, um, our profile deal where it says upload your pictures? Can you use that to put? No, no. Oh. <laughs> if you if if you if you need if you need me to to do it, uh, messenger is the best way to get a hold of me, uh, or email me. And uh, if you bring it here here to the office, uh, Richard's got books, and he'll even show you one right now. Okay, this is. This is, uh, I have one, but his is, his is newer. And at, the end of the, and at the end of your program here, you've got all the information on this book uh, in, in the handout there. This one is good because it just focuses on garden insects. Most of the books that I have are more general than that. But this is very helpful. And I like that this book here is kind of organized by what the symptoms are. I mean, all the chewing insects are in one chapter and the sucking insects are in a chapter and that's that saves some time and helps you get familiar with uh, with what you might have. Is, is there a top 20 hot list for, for Leon <laughs> County or for the area? Uh, Maybe for the region? No. Common? No. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. No. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, insects don't recognize boundaries that that much, but uh, what you what you can find is um, AgriLife has a lot of good information on.
crop by crop, uh, pests of beans, okay. pests of cotton, what, whatever. So that's that's uh, there's a lot of help out there. That makes sense. Friends, fellows, and foes. Now, most of the time, I have on my native plant, environmental, that kind of hat. But now I'm going to put on my gardener hat and we're going to look at these and think about insects because you've already kind of brought it up. You know, is that a friend? Is it, you know? Okay. What insects are your friends as a gardener? Alright. What insects are just fellas? And what insects are your foes? Friends. Insects that are vital to the health of the greater ecosystem. Uh, your garden, much as you like to think that you have dominion over that little half acre or acre or hundred acre or whatever you've been blessed with, um, it's not yours. You're just, you're just there right now. Uh, how Friends are insects that are vital to the health of the greater ecosystem. Increase the beauty and interest of the garden. Assist desirable plants or help control undesirable insects. There's a lot of ways that insects can be your friends. Fellows are insects that occur only occasionally and really do little harm or good. Sometimes people, and kind of often, people will send me a picture of an insect that is, uh, it is dramatically colored. It has attracted their attention. They've seen it. Now they want to know what it is. What is this, they ask me. Uh, most of the time, it's just a fellow. Um, how many of them do you have? Well, I just, just this one. Well then, if, if you only have that one insect, it, it, it's not going to do a whole lot, good, bad, or otherwise. But it could be the most interesting thing you see today. Hmm. Foes are insects that seriously impact the beauty or the productivity of the garden and occur in numbers that demand action or that make it uncomfortable or unhealthful to spend time in the garden. Um, what is the most important thing you can put in your garden? Mosquito trap. You. <laughs> you. Your shadow. Put yourself in the garden. That's the most important thing. If an insect is making it uncomfortable enough that you don't want to even be there, then that's definitely a foe. Okay, friends, pollinators, predators, parasites. There's two bees. They happen to be doing it, but the reason I put the picture in there, look at how much pollen is all over those fellas. Look at, look at that. They're just completely sprinkled. With those, all those little yellow spots, every one of them is a pollen grain. You see an insect crawling around all over a flower. If you had a magnifying glass, you'd be amazed at how much pollen just your average insect is picking up. Butterflies are not, by any means, the most important pollinators. Not even close. In fact, butterflies are our friends only while they're adults. Um, while they are in the caterpillar stage, they may cause some problems. If you are going to be a butterfly gardener, you have to realize that. Um, 
gardening for butterflies and other insects, keep in mind that butterflies and other insects that we, we think of as, I, I want a pollinator garden. Those insects, some of them are after nectar. Some of them are after pollen. Um, if, you, if you raise a lot of different kinds of flowers, the more different variety of flowers you have in the garden, the more likely you are to be raising things that are going to attract the pollinators that, that uh, we're getting more interested in. So, a variety in your garden, and especially natives. Yes, butterflies are likely to light on a plant that originated in China if it has a lot of nectar to it. But if you really want to have a garden that is sympathetic to the, the ecosystem, you are going to have a lot of native plants in it. A good idea, um, by biomass, by the amount of stuff you've got in the garden, if 70% of it is native, you're doing pretty good. That allows you to still plant your flower beds with colorful flowers from all over the world, but the majority of your foundation plantings and your trees should be natives because that's what our native insects are tuned in to. Um, edible plant parts that you need to provide for pollinators. You, you've got to realize that um, if you plant it for them to eat and they come and eat it, you can't complain. That's, that's why <laughs> it's there. Uh, I, I have a lot of fennel in my garden. Um, I'm the only one who likes eating fennel leaves and I've never had a bulb that I was ready to part with. And, and, and So why do I have it? Because every year I raise some swallowtails on it. And in a good year they'll eat it flat down. And that's not bad. I, that's why I have it. I have, I have a milkweed out near the, it's, it's, between, it's between the front gate and the dumpster. It's just out there. <laughs> um, for some reason, the monarchs have never found it until this year. This year, I had six monarch caterpillars. Mm -hmm. And they ate the whole thing. And that's good. Now that's why, that's why I've never mowed it down, you know. So, gardening for butterflies, here's a, here's a short list. If you really wanted a long list, you would go to the um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center website, and that's a great, great resource. Uh, the the uh, wildflower.org is the name of that website. And you, you can find resources there for you know, a list for butterfly plants and a lot of other lists too. But here's, here's a short list. Um, if you're gardening for butterflies, nectar is what the adults are after. Uh, Esperanza, which is native. Duranta, which isn't. Budlia, a butterfly bush, not native. Turk's gap, which is native. Uh, and lantana, which we have native and non-native lantana. Most of what we grow is the non-native. Uh, zinnias, uh, native to Mexico, that's almost Texas. Uh, and all the kinds of salvias. All of those are great for uh, adult butterflies. Butterflies will go from one species to another right after another, just sucking nectar or wherever they can find it. But when it comes to laying eggs and raising their babies, they're really 
most of them are really picky. They want a certain thing. So the caterpillar hosts milkweeds. If you want to encourage monarchs, you've got to have milkweed. They won't raise the babies on anything else. They're very picky. Uh, parsley and fennel, if you want to raise swallowtails, if you want to raise black swallowtails. Uh, passion vine, if you want to raise gulf frillary, some are just some of our most beautiful butterflies. For each kind of plant you raise, there's likely to be a, a native butterfly that wants to eat it. If you're trying to have a butterfly garden, insecticide cautions. You cannot use insecticides in a butterfly garden. They're, they're just, there's not a single one that you can use. You have to plant enough of what you're, you're planting that you can kiss it goodbye when the caterpillars come. That's what you planted it for. Uh, you can't even you can't even use insecticides near it because of the, the drift and if you use the most effective uh, insecticide against caterpillars uh, a non-toxic wonderful wonderful product uh, actually it is a disease of caterpillars you can't use that anywhere around where you're intentionally trying to raise butterflies. Mabeline, before you move on, mm -hmm. do you want to speak some about the native milkweeds compared to the non-native milkweeds? Yeah. If you go to the nursery and you want to buy a milkweed plant, chances are you are going to be offered one that is not native to Texas. It is a tropical milkweed from farther south. Uh, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Uh, most of them are orange and yellow. Uh, the, the, the excitement about monarchs goes back a number of years when we realized that they were in trouble. And everybody decided, um, oh, we should be raising more milkweed. And the smart people who grow stuff for us to buy said, oh, I'm going to raise milkweed to sell to people. Milkweed is hard. Turns out it is difficult. Some of it isn't even really attractive. But there's this tropical milkweed that is not too hard to propagate, and it's very pretty. Ah, we'll raise that one. We'll sell that one. Um, bad thing is, it doesn't die down around here. It doesn't die down like the natural milkweeds go dormant. After spring, they go dormant. You don't even realize they're out there after a while. The tropical milkweed just keeps on growing and blooming and growing and blooming. We need for the monarchs to go north and then come south and then go to Mexico. And we don't want them stopping in Texas over the winter. They're not a good plan. But if you have a lots of people with the tropical milkweed, they'll just, they'll just hang around. Um, so our advice to people, first of all, by natives, if you can find them, it's hard. It's hard to find native milkweed to purchase. Secondly, if you're going to use the tropical milkweed in the fall, cut it down. Even if it's still blooming, cut it down so that as the monarchs come back through, they don't see it. Keep on going. There is even some evidence that there is a parasitic disease of monarchs that is more common uh, in caterpillars on the tropical than in caterpillars on other kinds. So there's some reasons for not growing the tropical milkweed. But if you decide to grow tropical, uh, cut it cut it down in the fall, even if it still looks pretty, cut it cut it down before the before the monarchs come come back through. Um, there is a new protocol uh, 
available for how to germinate and, and grow uh, milkweed. And that might be something that we would someday, if we can all get back together again, um, maybe we need to do a program on how to germinate and grow your own milkweed from seed because it is one of the more challenging uh, plant propagation things. I have, I have done it using a slightly different method from the protocol that I have just recently uh, received. But it's, it's not just get, get milkweed seeds, plant them in the ground and back off. Yeah, it, it just doesn't work that way. Milkweeds are difficult. I hate to digress, but mm -hmm. um, back to the aphids, I, I heard you mention a number of uh, remedies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't hear anything on the insecticide level. What, what's the common remedy for them? Organic if... if Organic if possible. That's, you said it's real tough. Because, because they are sucking mm -hmm. the most effective treatment is going to be a systemic insecticide that is going to come up through the sap of that plant. And so that, that is where, when you look at, at advice for that, you know, what insecticide to use, uh, the most effective is going to be a, a systemic. Other than that, it's spot treatment for, you know, find a colony, squirt them, Watch them die. Yeah. 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 The, um, there's not much that's that's helpful as far as a residual. Um, so, what a home gardener who finds one colony on one plant, the advice is hit it with a water hose. Just spray them until they're scattered and they'll never get back together, and you'll do fine. Um, that. That advice on a commercial level is useless, you know. Um, so, Richard will probably be able to help you find, you know, specific uh, advice for that the systemic. But at, on a large scale, something like that, you're almost going to have to go to a systemic insect. So that would, uh, Richard, would you add anything to that? Uh, one of the one of the things that I would not advise anybody to do. Do not go out and buy uh, lady beetles to turn loose on, uh, on aphids. It doesn't work. Not one lady beetle ever has understood property lines. You <laughs> open the box, they fly. You know? Uh, you are wasting your money. And in addition, you may or may not get a native lady beetle. We've got a problem with an invasive lady beetle. And one of the reasons that we have that problem is, several years ago, a whole bunch of people went out and bought the things and turned them loose. And so now, uh, if you've ever had lady beetles try to hibernate in your house yeah. in the fall, what a nuisance. Yeah. So, lady, lady beetles, Naturally occurring lady beetles are wonderful um, aphid control on a small scale. Yeah. On a commercial scale, I would never count on them. Yeah. Okay. Um, honeybees and native bees. All the, all the talk that you hear, I'm afraid, is about honeybees. Um, I've, I have this this year, I guess it started it around Christmas time. I have, I'm now on my third book about bees. So I know a whole lot more about bees than I used to. One of the things that, that I know a lot more about is the difference between honeybees and native bees. People are very excited about honeybees and, and um, they People are understanding the importance of pollinators. And somehow we got into a situation where the honeybee has become the poster child for saving pollinators. Now I ask you this. If, if you were aware that the bird 
population is declining. If you were aware, and this is the truth, that a very high percentage of our birds, you know, we are losing them. We are losing them fast. Uh, Silent Spring was nothing compared to what's going on right now. Okay, you find this out or, and you make a poster. Save the birds. Are you going to put a chicken as the picture on your poster? No. Save the birds. No. Why not? That's the messy man. Yeah, that's not the birds we're worried about, are they? Chickens are doing just fine. They're more chickens than there ever were. Then why, if we are worried about save the pollinators, why do we put a honeybee on our poster? I think it's probably a marketing scheme. It's what it's what we relate to. It's, it's, it's we, we understand it, and it's not all that threat. It's that yeah, yeah. But yeah, is it? But does it? Does the honeybee deserve to be on that Save the Pollinator poster? No. No. They're in the education process. We can, yeah. get, we can get the real honey. <laughs> the, the honeybee is not in danger. The, the honeybee has problems, but the honeybee also has thousands of people working on those problems. They've also got thousands of people investing time and energy and propagating them and nurturing them and benefiting from them. Uh, honeybee is a whole separate game. What we really need to be worried about as gardeners is native pollinators because nobody speaks for them but they are so important and every time somebody puts in a honeybee hive down the street honeybees are generalists. By that I mean they will go to flower to flower to flower they're not picky. You know, if it's got nectar and it's got pollen, they're all about it. Here, there, and everywhere. Year round. Year round. They don't take a break. Native bees, the majority of native bees are specialists. That particular bee goes for a certain particular flower that blooms at a certain time. They are dormant the rest of the year. You're not even aware that they exist in your neighborhood, except for the one month that they're out there and active. And during that time, they're going to the flowers of that one particular thing, not everything. So the native population is very sensitive to a change in what kind of flowers are available. If, if their particular host plants aren't there that year, that can wipe out the entire population because they don't have the ability, they're not programmed to say, oh, if this isn't blooming, I'll just eat that. They, they just, they don't operate that way. Or when they come out and there's nothing blooming, they can't say, oh, I'll, I'll just go back in my hole and come back in a couple of months and see if things are better. They can't do that. So they depend on a regularity of the environment. Uh, climate change is a problem for some of these native bees because as the plants adjust where they live and when they bloom, the native bee population cannot adjust that quickly because they can die out in one year. So it's not like a seed that if it doesn't sprout this year, it can sprout next year. The bee population is not that resilient. So we have a real problem with our uh, native bees and our other pollinators. If you drove down my, my little country road, I have some neighbors, I guess they want to live in the suburbs. They mow the roadside two <laughs> inches tall. You could be driving down a city street. And then you get to my area where whatever grows is, that's what it is. And I've got the most wonderful bunch of wildflowers, including a bunch that I've brought in and added to the mix. 
try that if you have a homeowners association. Mm -hmm. huh? And that work, will it? <laughs> okay, the European honeybee. We've talked a little bit about it. Um, it is about the only insect that that is actually cultivated as an economic crop now. Uh, I, I think that there's still there's still a tiny market for real silk, but it's you know it's nothing financially it's nothing. But European honeybees that's a big deal, and <coughs> I, I do want you to be aware that if if you go to a store and buy commercial honey, there is a good chance that it was produced in China. Yeah, we do import a great deal of honey from China and it is of unknown uh, purity, um, unknown dilution, um, I get local honey, you know, and, and I, I, I'm i lucky I have a beekeeper in my family, so I, I've been a bee hostess. I'm, I'm not a beekeeper, but I was a bee hostess. Uh, he brought some hives over, and I, I went from being on the other side of the pasture while they worked the hives, <laughs> you know, complete bee suit, but, you know, like, oh, okay, y'all y'all go ahead, to uh, I've... I've been down there in the middle of the highs with the bug. I've had a bee in my bonnet. Whoa. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very cool. It is. But realize that every time we get another hobby beekeeper in an area, the native bees in that same community suffer from it. Yeah. Just so what can you do to encourage the natives? I mean, do you have a list of books or something you can do for a native bees? The thing that you need to do for native bees is native plants. Okay. Native plants and then during the winter time don't go crazy with the garden hygiene. A lot of these bees nest in old plant material. Stalks of grasses, stalks of elderberries, just if you go crazy and you have the neatest yard in the world you have not done the native bees any favors. You've got to be a little more natural. That's, that's the main thing. Uh, native plants that bloom at different times that are from that area and then don't go crazy with the garden hygiene. Um, predators. We got the lady beetle. <coughs> There's the little alligator shaped larva. Cool little things. Prey mantis, got the raptorial front legs. We do have imported uh, non-native um, praying mantises, some of the green ones. Some of them are so big that they literally can catch hummingbirds Aww. at their feeders. If you ever find a praying mantis hanging around your uh, hummingbird feeder, uh, relocate them. They are after the hummingbirds. Assassin bugs are predatory true bugs, predatory hemipterans. Um, some more friends, parasitic wasps. Look at that caterpillar. Look at all those little white things. They are cocoons of a little wasp that came and laid its eggs inside the skin of that caterpillar when the caterpillar was tiny. And for the last two or three instars, those little wasp larvae have been growing inside that caterpillar's body until finally they were mature. They come out, they cut a hole through the skin, make their little pupa, and the little tiny wasp, which is minute, little black waspy looking thing that you have to get a magnifying glass to see, flies off. That caterpillar is doomed. Doomed. 
if that caterpillar is the kind that eats your, your tomatoes, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now we get to the fellas. These are the ones where uh, it doesn't matter what they're doing for a living. If there's only one of them, you look at them, let them go. Um, take their picture, let them go. I found that when I'd never seen it before. It was on a mushroom, or one piece of shelf fungus. I thought it was pretty cool because the, the shelf fungus and the beetle were just about the same color. So I took his picture and I, I, went, to, I went to a, um, a Facebook resource or a, an internet resource that is, I, I'll, I'll say it's not amateur friendly. Uh, it's called Bug Guide. If you, if you halfway know what something is, I, it's great. It's very great. Uh, so I, I looked him up. Guess what his name is? Fungus Beetle. Yes, it's a fungus beetle. If I ever see him again, I know what to call him. I haven't ever seen him again. Good or bad? He's a fellow. He's just there. He's not there. He's just there. Uh, the fungus was on a rotting tree stump. It was just out there in the ecosystem, just out there in the world. <coughs> just, just a beautiful thing in nature. Foes. Mostly chewers or suckers of garden plants. But some of them are enemies of humans. Now there's, there's your tomato hornworm. There's the, there's the worm that his poor brother had the, had the parasites a couple of frames ago. This one, this one's doing fine until I found him. Okay. <laughs> Did you get him? I got him. <laughs> <laughs> I got him. Um, some things are out there that they're our foes because they can make us sick or they can hurt us while we're out in the garden and mosquitoes and fire ants are at the top of the list. Um, by the way, this, this is the kind that, that our study is looking for, that's out of the there. Uh, and of course our fire ant. Fire ants are bad because not only do they bite, they also sting. A lot of kinds of ants, they'll bite you, but they don't sting you. A fire ant grabs a hold of your skin, pulls it up, and then puts a stinger right into it. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're pretty evil. Um, you know that they're imported. They're not a native, not the kind that we have uh, the most trouble with. They, they came into the port of Mobile, Alabama. Um, we, we know the year, I think they probably know the name of the cargo ship that they, uh, they came in on. I never knew that. Yeah. But then they've spread throughout the south. Huh. Uh, they will probably never get much farther than they've gotten now because uh, they, don't like, they don't like freezing cold weather. So they will probably never be a problem up north, but uh, we got them in Texas forever. But that's the imported red fire ant. If you've ever been if you've ever been out in the okra patch, fire ants and okra, they love it. Um, they'll get up on the they'll get up on the buds and they'll go after the the sap and the it, it's almost it's sweet sap that's up there and um, and they will they will do enough damage that the fruit Never, never produces properly. Um, I, I found out you want an organic solution to that. Um, Vaseline right around the bottom of the stem. Mm. They can't, they can't crawl through it. Oh, it's too viscous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, have to put it, you have to put it back. You know, maybe once a week, but it's going to save your open every stalk. Every stalk. <laughs> yeah. Well, and just, again, my home garden, you know, in, in a good year, if I'm, if I'm doing my okra like I should, you know, 30 or 40 plants is all it takes if you, if you pick them like you should about every 36 hours. We had, I saw some little ants, they may be fire ants, mm -hmm. uh, but one of the, the first bloom, mm -hmm. the pod fell completely off. Yeah. Or if you if you get a pod, it'll be all crooked and misshapen, and 
never grows right. Well, that first one, I guess yeah. they damaged so, it. Sometimes that you have to be so careful about choosing insecticides to use in a vegetable garden. Okay. And there's some very good insecticides for fire ants, but they're not labeled for use in the garden. So you have to be awfully careful about that. Uh, veggie garden fro foes on your tomatoes. We've got sucking bugs, which includes uh, stink bugs, which most people will recognize as stink bug. But the one that I have the most problem with is this one here. This is the leaf-footed plant bug. It's not too distantly related from a stink bug. It still has that unpleasant odor to it. But the leaf-footed bug that we have the most around here has these big, wide hind legs, flattened out. That's where the name comes from. And they have a, they're brown with a white bar across the middle. They're, they're red and black when they're tiny. And there'll be a whole herd of them. One of the problems that we have sometimes is trying to distinguish little baby bugs. Is it going to be a friend or a foe? Because if it's going to be sucking your plant, then that's a foe. If it's going to be a predator, that's good. Well, if there's a whole bunch of them close together like this, that's going to be the bad guys. You know, they, they go around in herds when they're little and when they're big, too. Uh, the predators scatter out. Uh, the predators, they don't lay as many eggs in one spot, and the babies don't, you know, they, they scatter out. They, they, don't, they don't need to be eating each other, you know. So... Watch out for these guys yeah. and these guys on your tomatoes and your peppers. Hornworms, brickworms, and cutworms. Now, if you have a vegetable garden and it's not, you know, it's, you're not trying to grow caterpillars, you're trying to not grow them, the, the best chemical that you can use for that includes, as it's, active ingredient, a bacteria that causes a disease in caterpillars. And most of the time in the ingredients, it will list this by B-T, capital B, little t. <coughs> that stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, which is the scientific name of the bacteria. And the good thing about products containing BT is they make caterpillars sick and the, and the caterpillar dies. But it is a disease of caterpillars, not of more advanced animals. So it is extremely safe to use, even in a vegetable garden. And if your problem in, with your vegetables is some sort of caterpillar, then BT is the answer to your, to your problem. If you're trying to grow eggplants, the one thing that I've had the most trouble with with eggplants is flea beetles. Flea beetles, there's several different kinds. None of them are very large. You know, some of them are, some of them are little, but all of them jump. Thus, they're called flea beetles. But they make little holes in the leaves. It looks like sh a shotgun on, on a on a on a small scale. Many, many, many little holes. Do they come out at night? They come out at night and they're also on the back side of the leaf. That's why I can't ever see them. Go in your garden, your vegetable garden, at night. And if you can, get a flashlight that's got UV. Wow. If you get a UV light and go out in your garden at night, you will see bugs that that explain some of your problems that you can't find them in the daytime. What did you say? I just thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially like tomato hornworms. They're hard to, they're really well camouflaged, but at night they're out there on the very tip ends of the branches just eating away. Mm -hmm. You can pick them right up. Feed them to the chickens. Feed them to the chickens. I got flea beetles. What's the remedy for those jokers? 
Uh, seven. Seven. Yeah. So seven's kind of sort of pure all. It, 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 is very, it is very common for a garden. Just be, be cautious about putting it on plants that attract bees. And if you do, use it late in the afternoon. Bees okay. work in the morning. So don't put it out in the morning, put it out in the evening. Seven is also breaks down pretty quickly uh, in sunlight, so it's not something you can put on once. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to repeat it. And on anything that you put out, always check on the label and see if it tells you how many days between when you put it out and when you can harvest your crop. Mm -hmm. Because uh, with, some, with some insecticides, it's a long time. <coughs> uh, with, with others, it's just a couple or three days. If you're trying to grow squash, you know, three days is the difference between, yeah. you know, a perfect squash and, and one that, you know, in with the chickens, you know. So you have to look at that, that time between application and harvest. Um, here's, some, here's some things that get on our cucurbit plants. Uh, cucurbits include this family, squash, cucumbers, melons, and gourds. Um, we find the squash bug is our number one, number one enemy. That thing is hard to control. Uh, squash bugs, um, solid brown, no markings, solid, solid brown. Um, females are about that long, males a little bit smaller. They like dark places. So look for them around the base of the plant. Um, sometimes you can find them there. Uh, they lay these golden colored eggs that uh, if you're out in your garden, if you've got a small garden, you can find these eggs and you can pull that leaf off and squash those eggs and you can postpone the amount of damage that your squash bugs are doing. You can also catch those things. Um, my, my favorite way of doing it is, is to take a container for, um, we call it, we, in my family we call it foo-foo, uh, the stuff that you get in, in bottles for creaming your coffee. You know, it comes in little plastic containers that are kind of hand, you know, hand friendly. Mm -hmm. You can take one of those and slice the slice it off kind of on a diagonal and you've got a little bottle that you can carry around with a little bit of soapy water in it mm. and it's the end of it kind of like a scoop those things have an instinct to drop when they are when they are disturbed rather than fly off they're liable to just turn loose and fall so you can take your little scoop holding soapy water underneath them Hold it under them, disturb them, plunk into the water, they drown and they never come out. It's it's very you know it's very fun. <laughs> I'm not telling you that you can save your entire crop that way, but if you get out there early in the spring and you you work hard for one month, you'll get your squash crop. After that, you know, give up and let them go. That's, a, that's an insect that garden hygiene is important for. They overwinter as adults in places that are dark and near your garden. That could be a pile of compost. It could be behind the barn door. Um, watch, watch for these guys in the wintertime. You got your spotted cucumber beetle. This is one I've seen a lot of Facebook posts on this one lately. That is a moth. It doesn't look like a moth at first, and it's active in the daytime, but that is the squash vine borer. They lay their eggs down near the bottom of a squash plant. The caterpillar burrows inside the stem and eats that stem from the inside out. That makes it real hard to control because there's nothing you can spray on that plant that's going to get that caterpillar in a safe place. And one day, 
you go out in your garden and your favorite plant, I guarantee you, your <laughs> best one, your favorite plant, will be completely mm -hmm. collapsed mm -hmm. and you pick it up and the stem, it's just not even connected to the roots anymore. It was one of these guys, mm -hmm. the squash vine borer. And people will take a picture of this guy and put it on Facebook and um, a whole lot of people have been doing that lately. Uh, must be a bad year for them. Uh, okra. Okra gets a lot of uh, fire ants. Uh, there's a picture of a fire ants up around the around the flower. They also get a homopteron that's kin to you know kin to your cicada that has the interesting name of a dodger. Uh, leaf hoppers or dodgers. Uh, when they see you, they run around to the back side of the stem. You know, you'll walk up there and you'll see him and you'll get close to him and you'll go around to the back side of the stem. Hi, they're kind of cute. You can kind of herd them around and around. But they're <laughs> plant suckers and if you have a whole lot of them, you'll start to see the response of the plant. Grasshoppers are bad on okra too. That particular grasshopper right there if you ever see one, you'll, you'll notice him because that's a grasshopper that's about three inches long. That is the, our, our obscure bird grasshopper. They are huge. Yeah. They can, they can jump a long way. In the wintertime, we don't escape completely having insects. We do get um, plants that get on our greens on our cold crops, on our broccoli, and, um, and our cauliflower, and our cabbage, and our collard greens, and our turnips. And up to a point, we tolerate it. Um, we, we accept the fact that for out of our home garden, there may be a hole here and there in the leaves. We go to the grocery store, we don't want any holes in the leaves, right? Mm -hmm. We want that plant to be perfect. In our home garden, we, well, you know, that's one. And if you get too many caterpillars, then you have to do something about it. Uh, and it makes you wonder how many insecticides have been used on those perfect plants at the grocery store when you know that if you have more than just a few caterpillars, you, you've got to do something about that. Uh, you can't, for instance, that uh, cabbage head up there, you, you can't tolerate that. Uh, you can't you can't let that many caterpillars get into your into your cabbage. Uh, most of these caterpillars come from either yellow or white butterflies, and you end up with little green caterpillars that spend most of their time on the back side of the leaves. So it could be that um, you got a big problem before you realize that you have any problem. What would be the best answer? to this problem right here. Pick them off? Let's say you have too many. What's something we can spray? It's not a trick question. You've been given the answer already. BT. BT. This would be a great time to use that BT product. Now that's not a brand name. That's an ingredient. Um, I'll give you two brand names. Uh, there's probably three or four or five on the market, but uh, Thuricide or Dipel. Uh, if you go to the, if you go to the, um, any, anywhere that you can get a lot of insecticides, go to the feed store or the big box store, uh, Dipel or Thuricide. Is there any other with, those think of common, those, those are two big common ones, ones to find. That would be that would be your best answer, and why would it be the best answer? Because it's safe to use in a vegetable garden. Safe to use in a vegetable garden, and very specific for caterpillars. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What do you think? You go out in your yard and you see this guy right here. What do you think? What comes to your mind now as a as a master gardener? What do you think?
Call Nolly. <laughs> okay, that, that's a that's a that's an okay answer right there. What does the color make you think? Cucumber beetle. Squash. Oh, the squash. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't <laughs> remember. All right, well, now look, look. Squash book. Yeah. It's, it's X. It's, it's an a, X, so it's a true bug. Yep. Yeah. It's got really bright colors, which sometimes that's associated with things that are. Lord. Dangerous. That's that's called aposomatic coloring, and it's a warning color. This, this guy could be bad. That's called a harlequin bug, and one of them's not bad, but you never see one of them. You see dozens of them, hundreds of them. Okay, that's a sucker. That's that's a juice sucking plant. That 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 guy's gonna have to die. If he's in your vegetable garden, he needs to die. Okay. Integrated pest management. As, as uh, Richard said, you've got a whole chapter on that in your book. You all need to read that chapter. It is important not just for your success as a gardener, but for your safety. Uh, integrated pest management is a broad approach to reducing the economic impact of pest populations. Uh, it's a change in attitude over the past, oh, 10, 15, 20 years from eradication to management. I remember back when I was in high school and taking that test uh, at A&M that I told you about. One of, the, one of the things that we had to do on our test was, uh, here's a crop, here's an insect, what insecticide do you use and what's the application rate? We had it memorized. Every, every thing memorized. And I'll tell you that at least half of the insecticides that back in the day I could quote that application rate and all of that, half of them aren't on the market anymore. They've been taken off because they're too dangerous. Uh, not only have we changed our attitude about uh, how much danger we can put people in through using these chemicals, we've also changed our attitude between trying to wipe out every single bug and trying to keep the population low enough that you're not losing money and time and sleep over it. Uh, IPM addresses uh, prevention. Uh, we always rather prevent or minimize the problem. Monitoring, actually being out there and keeping an eye on and, and being a close observer of what's going on. Uh, pick the right method. Uh, pick the method that is going to work with the least impact on the environment and safety. Uh, pick things that uh, aren't going to put you in unnecessary risk. Identify. If you don't know what it is, if you cannot describe the symptoms, if you have not seen the insect, you're not ready to move on. You've got to identify what's going on. That, that's why it's always okay to ask what is, you know, what is this bug? It's always okay to ask that. You, it's the first. It's the first step. Once you've identified what it is, the question then is: Do, do you have a problem? Is it? Is it a foe? Is it just a fellow? Do you have a problem? Uh, what's causing the problem? What are the? What are the conditions under which this is developing? Because maybe maybe you can mitigate uh, what's causing the problem. Is the problem serious enough to treat? Is it something you can live with? 
Is it serious enough to treat? Should you wait? Should you hurry? Um, and then what treatment should be used? What's going to work? Unfortunately, when you when you throw these questions out into into the um, into the Facebook universe, you get a lot of bad advice. Let me encourage you to get to, to use research based information to make your decisions with. Uh, do not just throw it out there onto Facebook and say, what should I do? Because somebody is going to suggest boiling, pouring boiling water on it. And that may not be the best plan. Uh, considerations for treatment. Prevention versus treatment. Prevention is always better. Uh, timing is so important because for one thing, little bitty insects are more susceptible than great big insects. It's just almost universally true. If you can catch them while they're little, and soft and squishy instead of when they're full grown and hard and already done all the damage that they're ever going to do, then that was a better plan. Chemical versus non-chemical. Is there, is there no other way besides pouring chemicals on it? Have you investigated the alternatives to using chemicals? Sometimes you have and the answer is you got to use chemicals. Sometimes it is, but they're not necessarily what you need to do first. Uh, if you decide that, yeah, you're going to have to use some chemicals, then organic or synthetic. Now, time out here. I must speak chemistry to you for a moment. In chemistry, if we say that something is an organic compound, we are meaning that it is carbon-based. That organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon. But when you're working with the public and you use the expression organic and you're talking about food or you're talking about insecticides, it's a different, it's a different meaning for that word. From In that context, organic means derived from nature. And synthetic is going to be made in the lab. Okay? So think of think of who you're talking to when you're reading those words, because it, it's organic. All, all these chemicals contain carbon. Uh, organic versus synthetic is not, is not, is not the same as not dangerous and dangerous. I gave you the example of nicotine. Nicotine is organic. It's one of the most toxic things you can get a hold of. It's organic. Oh, wait, I thought organic things were safe. No, no, it's two different ideas. Two different ideas. Uh, biodegradable versus persistent. Biodegradable insecticides usually decompose because of sunlight, temperature, or time. Uh, persistent insecticides um, either are not photoreactive and even though the sun's shining on them they keep on being being whatever it is they are, or once they get into a body, uh, their body has no way of breaking it down, so it accumulates. Uh, typical example COVID. Uh, of that. Hmm? COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the typical example of, of a persistent insecticide goes all the way back to Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. DDT, uh, a persistent insecticide, uh, it is mm -hmm. fat soluble. It got into the fat tissue of whatever ate it. 
and then whatever ate that, and then whatever ate that, the body has no way to break it down, and once it's in the body, it's there for life. So animals at the top of the food chain that live a long time have over their lifetime eaten a great deal of it. So instead of being a tiny, tiny little bit that you might find in a, in a minnow, it gets to be enough uh, in, in an osprey or in a, a bald eagle that over her lifetime she's accumulated so much that it affects her ability to make eggshells. And she sits on her eggs and they break. Hmm. Persistent still there after years in her body, after years after she ate a fish that ate a fish that ate a minnow. Mm. So that's where you get the, the thing of persistent. I know it's inconvenient to use an insecticide that has to be put out every 10 days, but in terms of safety to the environment, it's probably better than something that you only put out once in a lifetime. Um, cost versus benefit. If you are good at watching for insects, you might be able to determine when to put out an insecticide most effectively. There is something called the um, threshold limit value. How many bugs in how much space before you put out your insecticide? Figuring that if you only have a few and the insecticide's expensive, don't put any out. On the other hand, if you've got a whole lot of them and they're going to eat a whole lot before long, time to put the insecticide out. A cost-benefit analysis. And, and finally, safety. Are you able to do all the things that this particular insecticide needs in order to use it safe. Reading the label. A number of years ago, an act was uh, put forth that we refer to as the FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Uh, the FIFRA Act plus other legislation that has come forth since then says what has to go on an insecticide label. There is a whole lot of information on an insecticide label, some of, some of which is in a, in a folder that you have to buy the insecticide before you can read the label. You know, um, um, if you don't want to do that, you're going to have to go online and read about that product before you decide to buy it or not. Um, some things that you're going to see on that label, one of the real important things to notice is does it have a signal word? This, this signal word ought to be easy to spot. It's, it's going to put that insecticide into one of four categories. Uh, category four is non-toxic. There is no signal word. Um, if there's nothing in there that's going to make you need to be more than ordinarily careful about, about using it. Uh, anybody, anybody can buy it. Uh, it's pretty much safe to use. Uh, category 3 is going to have the word caution on it. Um, a person with common sense who can read instructions can use a caution insecticide pretty safely. So you can go and buy this stuff. You can buy it at the grocery store, at the feed store, uh, at the big box store, um, in, in just about any quantity that you're likely to need. Category two, now we're getting up into insecticides that you really need to be prepared to be very, very careful with them. And if you can get them at the store, maybe only in small amounts. Uh, warning, is a, is a caution word that as a home gardener, you probably don't ever need to buy anything that says warning on it. Probably the, the most toxic things you'll ever be tempted to use would be ones that say caution. 
and danger. Uh, unless you are a commercial pesticide applicator with all the training and equipment that goes along with that, you will not be buying on something that says danger and there probably won't even be any of it on the shelves at the stores where you are likely to go shop. So most of the time as a home gardener, you're looking through the looking through all of the insecticides that are out there to use. Probably caution is the scariest word that you're likely to ever have to deal with. As you're reading that label, the first thing you need to be looking for is whether it is appropriate for the location where you are planning to apply it. This is more important than seeing whether or not the particular bug that you want to kill is listed. Much more important, actually. If you are looking for an insecticide for your vegetable garden, don't buy something that's for the same kind of bug, but it's to be used in a, in a pasture. It's not a smart thing at all. Uh, look for the kind of place, home, buildings, stable, vegetable garden, lawn, pasture, livestock, whatever it, it is in your situation, look for that first. Then look to see if it mentions the problem, pest, that you've got. There's thousands of different insects. Don't think that every one that it kills is going to be on the label. It can't. If, if it is, fine. If something similar is on the label, fine. But follow directions when applying the chemical. That means if it says to put two ounces in a gallon of water, put two ounces. Don't put four ounces in the gallon of water and then think that, well, dead, they'll get deader, right? <laughs> dead is dead. Use the instructions as they're written. They've been researched to be the right amount that is still safe to use. Um, observe cautions for protective gear and clothing. We're all bad about this. You know, we are. Because in the middle of the summertime, we really don't want to put on long pants and long sleeves and, and, and a big hat. and all. We don't want to do that. We want to go out there in our flip-flops and our shorts and use our insecticides and, and not smart. Um, lots of soapy water when you're done. Change clothes. Get out of, shuck out of, shuck out of all of those clothes that you were in when you were doing all of that spraying and wash them in soap and, and you, you're going to be a lot better off and wash your skin with soap. Um, maintain safe storage and disposal. Um, safe storage means where kids can't get to it, where uninformed adults can't get to it. If they're not trained, they can't get into it. Uh, a lock storage is the best. Read on the label what it says you can do with the old container. I know we're all wishing we could recycle more, but uh, empty insecticide containers are generally not uh, something that you can recycle. Uh, okay, learning more. Here's a short list of good things. A good guide book. This is not a huge book. This is a small book. But it's got a picture of about 10 million insects in it. <laughs> and, and I love it a lot. I should have brought it to show you. The Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. And you can look on Amazon and find these. A uh, good reference for gardeners. That's, that's this book right here. Garden Insects of North America. A good Facebook page. Now, I, I've been putting down Facebook a lot today, but there, there's, some, there's, there's good on, on Facebook. And one, as gardeners, I recommend Texas Plants and Invertebrates. If you go to one, 
it's it's a one-stop shop for plants and uh, invertebrates so uh, that's it's pretty good one thing to realize though is that there are some people who answer questions that are really good at it and there are a lot of other people that just kind of throw answers out there and so if you want something identified or you want advice don't wait don't get three comments and never look back because the the smart people who know the answers may not have looked at the, the post yet you will know after you see them uh, who's who's a little more reliable for identification and stuff and and uh, I belong to another Facebook page that I really admire it's it's something I know a lot less about but it's uh, uh, southeastern what was the exact name of it uh, southeastern Texas what snake is it um, I'm, I'm not the greatest at identifying snakes, and I decided I wanted to get better at it. And on that Facebook page, they have about 15 administrators who are super good. And if you're not an administrator, you don't get to guess. There are no guesses at all. Uh, and so if somebody posts a picture of a snake, the answer you get is right and I, I'm getting a lot better because I always I see a picture I think oh I think I know what that is and then I look at the comments and I see whether I'm right or not I don't have to I don't have to read through 15 yahoos who are guessing until somebody who knows what they're doing gives the answer well I, I wish Texas plants and invertebrates was like that but it's not it's like anybody can answer so Sometimes you get the right answer, and sometimes you don't. <coughs> Usually you will, if you wait. Uh, it saves a lot of time, and I use it quite a bit, but for, for a more precise answer, there are other places I go. All right. Uh, Arlen Mosh is the person that I got some of the super close-up pictures from. I appreciate him for saying I can do that. Um, we have got 35 minutes. I'll give you your choice. Some of these we've talked about already quite a bit. Um, I'll give you your choice of two. And let's, let's leave out, well, I won't leave out any of them. You can pick from you can pick from anyone in any of them. We can, we can learn a little more about something that looks interesting to you. Or if there's a particular insect that's not on that list, uh, we can talk about that too. There just won't be any pictures to go with it. <laughs> okay. I'll give, you, I'll give you one minute to decide where, where your vote is going to go. Which are the most common out of the five? Um, well, fortunately, that's really rare. I hope you never see one of them. Uh, we all know mosquitoes are everywhere. Monarch butterflies is a big story with that. Screwworm fly is my favorite. Uh, and neonic insecticides, um, a very hot top. So they're all, they're all good. They're all good. All right, Richard, I'll give you the first vote. Let's talk a little bit about neonics. Okay. Because that's something that they might encounter. They could say, oh, hey, you know, this is this product, but what are the what are the repercussions of using neonics? Ooh, yeah, yeah, neonics. All right. insecticides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. You go to the you go to the store to buy you some products to kill you whatever it is that you've got. The question that you might have here is 
how do these insecticides go about killing the pest? Does it give them a disease like uh, BT does? Does it cause them to stop eating, stop growing, failure to molt like, uh, like the IGRs do? Or does it affect some other internal system like their nervous system? Um, you, can't, you can't know that by reading the label. Okay? Insecticides over the years have been developed uh, that, that act in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways that many insecticides work is to, to hit the nervous system. And, and as I said, one of the most toxic things that you can get into is nicotine. Now, nicotine is a, it's an organic product. It is a derivative from tobacco and was at one time purified and used and sold as an insecticide. The, uh, the product that I remember from many years ago was called Black Leaf 40. And it was 40% nicotine. Man, that stuff was dangerous. Would it kill spider mites? Oh yeah, it was great. <laughs> it, it was a wonderful product, except that you could kill yourself with it. Uh, so they took it off the market. Well, chemistry being what it is, we know exactly what a nicotine molecule looks like. We know exactly how it works in the brain and in the nervous system. So some chemist somewhere says, well, if you can't use nicotine, is there something that operates in a very, very similar way? Something that we could produce in the lab that would give us the same results, uh, dead bug, uh, as nicotine that we could put on the market. So we get a class of insecticides that are called neonicotinoids. Neo, new, new nicotines. New nicotines, neonicotinoid is way too long, so now we just refer them as neonics. And there's there's a list of molecules that are very similar in their in their physiology, in their in their action, and they have become some of the most used insecticides that we have. Neonics can be applied in several different effective ways. One is as a liquid that you spray on the, the plant. Uh, another is to use them to coat seeds, pre-treated seeds. The idea being that the plant will absorb it and that will not only kill off any insects that might get into the sack of seeds, it will also kill any insects that bite the plant as it's growing at least for a little while. So what happens with that is that you get some degradation of neonicotinoids when the sun shines on them, but not a lot. A lot of these insecticides get into the soil which then gets into water. And one way or another, we are getting neonics in air, in rain, in water. And as it moves from one spot in the ecosystem to another, we can have effects because a lot of these neonics have a long lifespan. They don't, they don't break down very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, just a question. Um, 
I know there's a lot of genetic manipulation that's going on. Mm -hmm. Is some of this being in, put in plants this way? Uh, Do the we know? Is it? Uh, well, yes, but that's the okay. That's it's okay. It's it's, it's like it's like uh, it's like a different a different one of these approaches. It's what we're doing with plants has a lot less to do with neonics. In fact, I don't know of any of any of GMO that that is specific to, to neonics. It is. We are doing things that that relate to the. Uh, insect disease that is uh, the okay. target of the BT. Okay. That same that same chemical can be put that can be put into a plant genetically where it kills its plants kill their own kill yeah. their own bugs. And then the you're not doing that. They're not uh, doing that. That's that's a that's a different from. line. That's a different line of action. We yeah. also have uh, GMO plants that are engineered to be resistant. To some herbicides right. so that you can use if your crop is resistant to a herbicide and you have your crop and weeds and you spray it the weeds die the crop is safe gotcha. okay uh, but as far as directly with neonics doing anything with plants that relates directly to neonics I'm not aware okay just um, ask yeah sorry. that's a good question um, one of the most important things that we have found with neonics is that honeybees like it. Honeybees are actually uh, attracted to plants that have neonics on it. Um, hey, people are people are attracted to nicotine. It's addictive. Okay, uh, no surprise. Um, insects are kind of addicted to neonics, and so. We actually are very concerned about using neonics uh, anywhere that honeybees are a factor. We're, I, I'm not saying that other insects aren't attracted to it. I'm just saying, well, we do a lot of research on honeybees. And things that we find out about honeybees uh, might be true about other kinds of insects too. But honeybee is an industry, so there's a lot of money spent uh, researching honeybees. We know more about them. Um, to the point that, um, and I think Europe is the, the leader in this, and has been ahead of North America, um, pretty much banning the use of neonics because of its detrimental effect on uh, non-target species. So I think that neonics are, are going the way of some of the other insecticides that have been taken off the market because they're uh, too hazardous for one reason or another. Um, if you love neonics stuck up now, um, they may not be they may not be on the market in the same way in the future. It's becoming more and more restrictions in in using neonics. Here's an idea: the total neonicotinoid concentration in nanograms of pesticide per gram of honey. Okay? Um, you can see just their first impression of this looking at the looking at these pie charts here. Um, and here's here's your list of neonics by the name of the chemical. You can see that different parts of the world use different use different products. Um, in, in Africa, South America, to some extent North America, imidacloprid is one of the most popular. Uh, just different, different products, different concentrations. Um, but no, nowhere is there an escape from it, is there? There's some of it, there's some of it being used everywhere. Uh, a lot of this data came from Europe, um, but this tells you this tells you something else, and that is the honeybee 
industry. Look how widespread the honeybee industry is. Another reason that another reason that we're we're not we're not thinking that honeybees are about to go extinct anytime soon. Okay. What are your questions about neomix? I don't know enough about it to ask any questions yet. Have you used it? Hmm? Have you used any? Use them all the time. So they're effective. Uh, it's it's unless you are using seven or malathion, you're probably you're using a neonic. Okay. Yeah. If if you if you look at whatever insecticide product you pick up, if you look for this little list right here, you you're probably going to find it. Um, it, since it's a family of insecticides, let's see, what other families would we have? Well, we have organophosphates, um, that's, you know, the, between the neonics and the organophosphates, that's the majority of what the, the average consumer is going to pick up. Um, So what are they going to replace them with? Just come up with a different chemical? And that slides under the thing? Or what are they going to do? If I knew the answer to that. <laughs> You'd be rich, but I mean. And I, and, I, <laughs> and I knew where to put my investment money. There you go. The, now where would Roundup fall in this category? Okay, now with Roundup you're looking at a herbicide. Which is going to have its own list of you know, family traits and its own set of problems. Okay. Um, and then so, to mysious earth. You know, so I, you hate, I, I hate to, I hate to criticize uh, a product. Diatomaceous earth is a great example of a product that probably very effective under certain circumstances, totally ineffective in other circumstances, but hyped way beyond what its effectiveness is. Diatomaceous earth, the concept is it's sharp and it's going to cut them as they walk across it and they're going to bleed to death and die. Well, that's, that's fine if if they really walk across it, it's completely dry. Um, diatomaceous earth might show some effectiveness inside. You know, if you're putting it in around baseboards and closets and in drawers and places like that, you might see some effectiveness. To put it outdoors where it's going to mix with sand and dirt and compost and rain not going to have any effectiveness that's measurable. Um, as, you, as you journey through master gardening, I, I hope you become very tuned in to what remedies have research-based proof behind the use of them and which are just um, wishful thinking, you know. Uh, can you kill a fire ant mound by pouring boiling water down it? Yeah, if you have 15 gallons of boiling water. <laughs> How are you going to get that to the far corner of your yard? And yet, uh, you will see people, oh, just put some boiling water on it, you know. Put some vinegar on it. I wish, you know. Okay. I never bought it. I've just I've seen yeah. a lot. Yeah, well, of people. you will you will hear, and and it is a product that, as I say, under exactly the right conditions, is probably a very good idea, and, and it's absolutely it's non toxic, and there's good things about it, but um, don't don't carry it beyond what it's actually able to do. Scattering it all over your yard is going to be a you know big waste of money.
Right. Yeah. Save your save your money. Okay. All right. What else can we talk about then? Well, what about that? Okay, you was talking about putting uh, Vaseline like on the okra stalks. Yeah. That neem oil. Now, what is? Uh, neem oil is an organic that has shown to be um, a pretty good treatment for a lot of things. Um, it isn't oil. Um, it is not too safe to put at high concentrations on plants, especially when it's hot. So uh, under, under the right conditions, it is certainly worth trying. It is one of the newer um, organic products that that you might get and, and uh, has, has a lot to recommend it. Um, another organic product that is very effective in a lot of situations is spinosad. Uh, that is an organic product and it's in everything including some of the flea pills that you give your dog. Mm -hmm. um, quite a wide range of insecticide uses for that, for that product. I saw a video on YouTube where these people took paper plates, the foam paper plates, mm -hmm. and then they spread them, well, they painted them bright colors first, and then they spread Vaseline on them and hung them different places mm -hmm. throughout their garden, and mm -hmm. the bees, or the, bee, the bugs were attracted. And they would go out there and collect the plate. And 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 here's the here's the question is, were those all bad bugs? Right. Were they were they catching an equal number of their good bug predators or the fellows that were just passing through? The problem with something like that is if it's if it's very non specific, you may be doing harm at the same time you're doing good. I have a question. Fire ants in my garden. What can it do? There is one product, I've used it, and it was not nearly as effective as I was hoping. I was, oh. I was hoping for perfect kill, all right? Me too. Uh, <laughs> what is over and out? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Over and out. And you can use it in your garden. That is, a, that is one that, and read the label, mm -hmm. but it is a fire ant killer that is labeled mm -hmm. for vegetable garden. Okay. Because most of them are not. Uh, yeah. my, my, my garden I try to tell the ants, no, you can you can you can go outside the edge of the garden. And then as soon as they do then I can kill kill them with something. Is that the only it. thing but, that it focuses on? Is uh, well the way you apply it, you, you put it on the nest and so it's okay. it's um, outside the garden. What yeah, you outside the outside the garden with fire ants or theen is the um, the first product that came out it was an ortho chemical okay. product orthene. Um, what's the name? What's the name of that um, active ingredient in orthene? Um, 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 okay, is this? And don't need I fire much. fire ant fire if it's like fire ant killer. Okay. It's white powder and it stinks yeah. worse than anything you ever okay. imagined. That's the one. Uh, surrender uh, is a uh, is a generic product that's very good for fire ants. My chickens don't need to get near any of this stuff. Ah, uh, your chickens don't need to get into into any of this. But if you use it the way the package directs, mm -hmm. um, they're not they're not likely to. But I would I would try very much to keep it away from from mm -hmm. them. Uh, chickens are curious. And they will get into things that you don't you don't expect them to. Acephate. 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 Yeah. That's the uh, chemical active Chem ingredient. Yeah, it is the active ingredient. Thank you. And you can also use that for the Texas leaf cutter. Ooh, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I want to tell you about screw worm flies. I just do. <laughs> okay, since it's something you'll never ever in your life have to worry about. <laughs> I, I, was, I was gonna say, I was gonna say that they're not here, are they? I'm no, not they're, they're not. We, 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 we won. Are you? Oh, I thought you were angry. <laughs> we won. 
Uh, now, we haven't won all over the whole world, but we've won in the United States. Uh, you can see where screwworm flies are, are found. It's the, the tropical uh, mm -hmm. regions of the world. And a screwworm fly, it is a fly that lays its eggs on open wounds. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the maggots actually go into living tissue. They're not just cleaning up tissue that's dead. They're actually going into living tissue. And that used to be a multi-million dollar project, uh, problem for Texas uh, cattle ranchers. And uh, back in the 1970s, uh, I believe it was, somebody figured out what to do. I just have one, one picture of it. Uh, we figured out some things about their life history. We figured out that the females only mate once. Now, all insects are not like that, but screwworm flies, she only mates once. And so we also figured out how to raise them in commercial settings. They figured out how to raise them on blood. Okay, and they were doing it in Texas, mostly down around Beeville. They were raising it on cattle blood. Uh, they, they got it from a, a slaughterhouse situation and they would raise these flies on trays of blood. And by using radiation as they were growing up, they could make the males sterile. And so they would, they would put the male pupae in little flimsy cardboard boxes and they would put them in crop duster planes <laughs> and they would fly over South Texas and throw them out. And when they hit the ground, the, the boxes would come apart and by that time the, the male flies had hatched out and they'd be dozens and dozens of male flies coming out of these little flimsy cardboard boxes. And the female flies in the neighborhood, remember she only mates once, if we put enough of these irradiated sterile male flies in the neighborhood, there's a good chance her first encounter will be with one of those flies and not with one of the fertile native males. So she mates with an uh, infertile male, goes off and lays eggs that won't hatch. And we do that and we do it and we do it until finally our population crashes. We have driven the fire ant out of the United States and almost, I think, out of Mexico. Screwworm fly. Uh, fly. And we had one little outbreak last year in, in uh, Florida, and there, I don't know that they ever finally decided, but there was, there was suspicion that it somehow had come over from Cuba. Was, they still have some in Cuba. Now here's the here's the, the situation. Now we know how to we know how to eradicate screwworm flies. A multi-million dollar pest to the livestock industry. Notice Africa. Africa is another place where screwworm flies are bad. Um, emerging societies over there raise a lot of beef. Okay? Problem for them. Hey, we, we, we know what to do, right? So, we try to do it over there in Africa. What are the, what are the problems of that? What happens when we can raise cattle much easier and make more money off of them? What do we do? What do we do? Raise the price. We raise more cattle. Now which we gets rid of the land, which gets rid of the ecology, which wipes out Africa. Okay. Because we make it easier to raise cattle, we raise more cattle. And if we're in Africa, how do we raise more cattle? We clear cut. We clear cut, or we Burn. we take a, we take and the same thing in Brazil. Uh, 
we take over areas that were being used by the native wildlife. So in doing good, maybe we un have an unintended consequence. In, in environmental science, we have a saying, you can't do one thing. You can't do one thing. If you do one thing, there are, there's a ripple effect through the environment. What happens because of that one thing becomes many things. So the screwworm fly is a is a cautionary tale of how how uh, first of all how the understanding of the biology of the insect was critical. We had to know how the insect operated. Then we had to have the technology to exploit that situation. And then we, we accomplished an excellent goal here in the United States. Um, can you export that technology directly to an entirely different part of the world? Um, not necessarily with exactly the same results. It's, it's just an interesting tale of history and an insect that in your lifetime you will personally um, not encounter if you stay in Texas. Yeah. Well, that's, that's enough. Um, as, as I suggest, watch your, watch your garden, whether it's, you know, whether it's your lawn or your, or, or your hemp crop or, or your veggies or wherever it is, be more alert to what insects are out there. If one catches your attention, you know what to do now. Uh, catch it, bring it, take its picture, get it to me, get it to Richard. Completely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to tell you whether or not you need to worry about it. And if you do need to worry about it, what some of the things are that you can think about as far as control. Um, and please do read that chapter in your in your hand in your textbook thing uh, on IPM. It will give you a lot of information about methods that don't involve insecticides that, that might be very practical for you and would be the first thing to try. Okay? All right. Any any last any last questions? The next time the next time we meet, we'll be talking about uh, a lot of plant topics, um, a lot of botany stuff. But between now and then, you're going to be you're going to be learning a whole lot of uh, useful things from from people who really know what they're talking about. So hope you enjoy all the class. Mm -hmm.